Hi, I'm Dr. Robert Silverman, and it's a pleasure for me to present this webinar. Uh, it's quite exciting for me to talk about brain awareness, and uh, it is Brain Awareness Month as I record this in June. So I want to speak about some different ideas. I really want to share how the brain can be compromised, how to avoid the compromise of the brain, and all the different pathways that feed brain function and also uh, can also damage brain uh, and lead it to a compromise. So I'm gonna talk about some protocols for neurodegenerative disease. But I'd really like to start out by uh, going over the groundwork of what we're gonna cover in this webinar. So in the next few minutes, I'm really going to give that abstract introduction. As we all know that June is a Brain Awareness Month. It's an excellent time to look at the current state of Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases. Statistics from the National Alzheimer's Association are without question a good place to start. In the US today alone, about 5.8 million people are living with Alzheimer's disease. By 2050, the number of people aged 65 and older with Alzheimer's is projected to reach 13.8 million. The number of people living with other forms of cognitive decline, dementia, and neurodegenerative disease is equal to those with Alzheimer's. And those numbers are projected to rise as well. The costs of neurodegenerative disease are without question staggering. In 2020, the Alzheimer's Association estimates that they will cost the nation 305 billion, rising to as high as 1.1 trillion by 2050. And that's not counting the work of 16 million Americans who are unpaid caregivers for people with neurodegenerative disease. So one of the things that we want to without question is create an awareness and hopefully lead to prevention. Despite the human and financial costs of neurodegenerative diseases and extensive research for a cure, we have very few effective treatments to this point. Awareness and prevention without question are the best approaches. The brain changes that happen in failing cognitive function probably begin years, possibly 20 years or longer before symptoms such as memory changes become apparent. Because the damage occurs so quickly, it's possible that being aware of your risk and being alert to the earliest signs and symptoms can help manage the changes as they happen. Making dietary and lifestyle changes can help prevent, slow, or even stop the processes. We know that no one specific gene directly causes neurodegenerative disease. However, we also know that having the genetic variant of APOE4 gene does increase your risk. The APOE4 gene makes a protein that carries cholesterol in the bloodstream. It comes in several different forms or alleles. One variant, known as the APOE4, increases your risk of dementia. Approximately 25 to 30% of the population in the U.S. has this variant. It's important to note that while APO is a risk factor, I should say APOE4, having it doesn't necessarily mean you'll develop neurodegenerative disease later in life. And having a different variant doesn't always protect you. However, the allele is considered an independent risk factor as are high cholesterol and high blood pressure. Combine the APOE4 variant with high cholesterol and or high blood pressure and your risk of developing failing cognitive function is nearly tripled. You can't do anything about the allele, but you can avoid or lower high cholesterol and high blood pressure through dietary and lifestyle changes and medication if necessary. So talking about uh, amyloid and tau, let's really touch base on this. Your brain contains about 100 million neurons forming uh, approximately a hundred trillion connections known as synapses with each other. The synapses from the brain circuits, the mechanism for memory, thought, emotion, sensations, and movement. The hallmark of failing cognitive function is the disruption of the brain circuit by accumulation of proteins both inside and outside the neurons. Beta amyloid plaques build up outside neurons and an mammal form of the protein tau built up inside the neurons. Both proteins cause the characteristic brain change of neurodegenerative disease by gradually damaging and killing neurons. Let's get into brain health. A healthy lifestyle as you age protects both your body and your brain. Poor diet, smoking, drinking alcohol, being overweight, and being out of shape are all independent risk factors for neurodegenerative disease. In combination, they raise your risk even more. One reason as these risk factors can cause reduced blood circulation to the brain this is a significant underlying cause of cognitive decline and dementia. Gut health, as we all know, the gut and the brain are intertwined. We're gonna spend 40 minutes discussing that very interesting bi-directional pathway. But what really ties them together? Inflammation. The loss of cognitive function, dementia, and a range of neurodegenerative diseases are all related to brain inflammation that originates in an imbalance of the gut bacteria. 
If inflammation stemming from the gut is reduced, it also reduces brain inflammation. A 2016 study suggests that it truly does. In this study, 60 older adults with significant loss of cognitive function had a blood test called C-reactive protein, a powerful marker of tissue inflammation. They were divided into two groups, 38 their normal diet plus a drink that contained probiotics, beneficial bacteria. The other 30 had a normal diet plus a placebo drink that tasted the same but didn't include probiotics. After 12 weeks, their blood again was tested. The placebo group show, showed no change or increase in this C-reactive protein, but the probiotics group all showed a significant drop in the inflammation marker. They also showed an improvement on cognitive tests. The bottom line is anything that you do positively to help gut health will definitely influence good brain health. And last, interesting, you want to, if you want good brain health, lower high cortisol. High levels of the stress hormone cortisol are associated with cognitive decline due to alterations in the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex in the brain. While stress reduction techniques such as yoga and med meditation can help relieve stress, they may be as not as sufficient to help the loss of cognitive function from cortisol. So one of the biggest things that we need to realize about cortisol is high in the morning. Let's keep that stress hormone down. I always like to begin most of the webinars with a quote. I will never understand why every organ in the body gets support and sympathy when it is ill, except for your brain. We take our brain for granted. So 10 ways to love your brain. This comes from the Alzheimer's organization. So growing evidence indicates that people can reduce their risk of cognitive decline by adapting key lifestyle habits. These lifestyle habits without question will enable you to achieve maximum benefit for the brain and the body. You want to break a sweat, engage in regular cardiovascular exercise that elevates your heart rate, increases blood flow to the brain and body. Many studies have shown physical activity reduces the risk of cognitive decline. Hit the books. Any form of education will reduce your risk of cognitive decline and dementia. Many people over 50 and 60 have decided now to learn another language, another skill. Butt out. Evidence shows that smoking increases the risk of cognitive decline. Quitting smoking can reduce the risk that leads to uh, levels comparable to those who have not smoked. Follow your heart. Evidence that risk factors for cardiovascular disease and stroke, obesity, high blood pressure, and diabetes negatively impact your cognitive health. Heads up. Brain injury can raise the risk of cognitive decline and dementia. Wear a seatbelt. Use a helmet when playing contact sports. Avoid falls. Fuel upright. Eat a healthy and balanced diet that's low in saturated fats and avoid sugars, higher in vegetables and some fruits to decrease the risk of cognitive decline. Mediterranean diets have been shown to be very positive for cognitive decline. Catch some sleep. Not getting enough sleep, or Z's if you will, can lead to conditions like insomnia, sleep apnea, can damage memory and thinking. Sleep is the time when you get to detox your brain. Take care of your mental health. Some studies link a history of depression with increased risk of cognitive decline. So let's try and manage our stress. Buddy up, social. Even in this difficult time period, you see people FaceTiming versus just calling. Stay socially engaged may support your brain health. Social activities are meaningful to all of us. Be part of your local community. Share activities with friends and family. Stump yourself. Challenge and activate your mind. Build a piece of furniture. Complete a jigsaw puzzle. Try something artistic. Play a new card game. Do something to challenge yourself. And of course, break a sweat. Without question, get moving. So promoting brain health via a triad of healthy lifestyles, proposed associations and potential underlying mechanisms between physical activity, cognitive activity, and a Mediterranean style dietary pattern and increased physical and cognitive performance. The mechanisms underpinning the relationship between cognitive activity and cognitive function may be similar to those of physical activity and potentially include increased resting cerebral blood flow, synaptogenesis, and neurogenesis. So when you look at this, you always want to stimulate new neurons in aging brains. 
Exercise leads to beneficial changes in the adult brain, including the birth of new neurons and increased co connections among existing neurons. One of the ways in which physical activity seems to induce this neuroplasticity is by increased production of a, pr a protein called brain-derived neurotrophic factors, BDNF, which promotes neuronal growth and survival. Recent research suggests cognitively engaging the brain during physical activity enhances this process C. The effects of resistant exercise on cerebral redox re regulation and cognition. Great explanation of an interplay between muscle and brain. The interactions between bodily systems from regular physical exercise, a synergistic effect between muscle, brain, and heart, which modulates molecular, biochemical, and physical changes, ultimately decreases the risk of chronic disease. Interesting how we're going to piggyback on what we said earlier and the effects of resistant exercise and cerebral redox re regulation and cognition. And once again, let's continue on the interplay between muscle and brain. Resistant exercises, as we said earlier, induces BDNF generation. The BDNF release from muscle contraction reaches the brain and binds to the TRK receptor to induce the phosphorylation of different cascades of signaling pathways which results in the additional secretion of BDNF. Brain BDNF leads to the activation of NRF2, which regulates the expression of an antioxidant molecule. NRF2 is one of the critical antioxidant molecules and one of the biggest detrimental nutrients, I wouldn't even want to call nutrients, toxic waste would be free radicals. So again, let's expand a little on the muscle in the brain. Resistant exercises activates IGF-1 signaling in muscles, increasing muscle mass and strength. IGF-1 is produced by muscles reaching the brain via circulation and binds to specific receptors that lead to the activation of signaling pathways. It acts on specific targets and results in improved cognition. IGF-1, as we all know, is insulin growth factor. Potential biomarkers for physical exercise induced brain health. This is a very intriguing slide, a lot going on here. Let's take a good look at what it's implying. Exercise enhances hippocampal plasticity and hence improves cognitive performance. Physical activities promote in the production and release of a variety of mediators in both central and peripheral nervous systems, such as neurotrophic factors, myokines, adiobokines, and cytokines. These molecules enter the brain and regulate hippocampal plasticity by affecting neurogenesis, synaptic plasticity, and dendritic remodeling, eventually improving learning and memory performance. High and low intensity found to influence the brain differently. So after a low intensity, MRI showed that networks in the brain associated with cognitive control, attention were stimulated. While after high intense exercise, networks associated with emotions were more active and those related to fatigue and motor functions were decreased. Core exercises for brain health. So here you're seeing somebody do a proper plank, plank on their forearms. So strengthening and activating the core muscle stimulates the midline cerebellum, which is without question responsible for movement coordinations and posture. By repeatedly exercising your core muscles, you are stimulating that aforementioned part of your brain. So the muscles communicate with the brain to get proper movement and strength. Cross crawl. Cross crawl like this young lady is showing is uh, cross lateral activity in which you cross the midline of the body. The premise is to touch the opposite hand and knee or foot. Performing the movement increases communication between the right and left hemispheres of the brain. This allows for a stronger neural communication between the two sides. It is without question essential for physical coordination. It's critical for cerebral activities because you can learn languages, read, and it's good for hand-to-eye coordination. Exercise. Physical exercise increases irisin levels and BDNF synthesis, as we said earlier. In turn, irisin enhances BDNF synthesis and release, leading to augmented neuroplasticity, achieving the collaboration of irisin and BDNF. In addition, irisin modulates STAT3 signaling leading to hippocampus proliferation. So therefore, in this context, exercise and its sequela, irisin and BDNF, may contribute to neuroplasticity. 
neuroplasticity can lead to the reduction of the incidence of Alzheimer's disease. So when you really look at this, there's a lot going on again. Bottom line here, here's your takeaway. The governor component causing a slow slowing of circulation was lost somewhere from the model. Bottom line is your brain is the chip. Your brain is the master of all that's going on in this. It's the master of talking to your heart, whether your muscles are going to be fatigued. It also needs to know about your mitochondria. So your brain, although it's only three pounds made of the consistency of jello, we cannot live without a brain. And I certainly cannot live a quality life without a healthy brain. Everybody knows this is my particular slide in that I use this slide at all times. I use this in every one of my webinars. So let's really take a good look at this slide. I'm going to do this in a very epigrammatic fashion. We talked about it in a previous webinar going through the gut. So essentially, if you have leaky gut damage to intestinal permeability, you are going to have a greater incidence of food sensitivities. Greater incidence of food sensitivities, you're also going to have a greater incidence of localized inflammation, systemic inflammation, and ultimately possibly autoimmunity. The big takeaway will be the gut and the brain communication. Now, a lot of the leaky gut comes from something called dysbiosis and unleveling of good and bad bacteria. Also an expression of LPS and endotoxin that's released at the time of injury that LPS starts inflammatory markers throughout the body. When we have leaky gut, we have a higher incidence of toxin chemical overload to the liver, leading to liver dysfunction, higher incidence of insulin through blood sugar problems, insulin resistance, pre-diabetes, et cetera. Body composition is usually increased. In addition, we talked about the idea of autoimmunity. So we have a higher incidence of thyroid. For all your musculoskeletal people, when you have a leaky gut, you have more susceptibility to inflammation, inflammation both at the joint and soft tissue level. And a huge takeaway here is the gut-to-brain axis. The damaged gut damages brain, gut on fire, brain on fire. Whatever you do to your gut, you do to your brain. You're not going to have a healthy brain without also having a healthy gut. Both the small intestine barrier and the blood-brain barrier made of the same protein and both have the same thickness. They communicate bidirectionally through hormones blood system, and in a millisecond through the enteric nervous system via the vagus nerve. So systemic LPS is linked, as I said earlier, to multiple disorders. We can see joint, heart, immune modulation, liver, thyroid, metabolic, lung, and of course, the brain. Once again, can't have a healthy brain without also having a healthy gut. So the structure of the mucus layer varies with regional locations within the GI. So when we look at figure A, the small intestine contains a single layer of mucus, which is loosely attracted to epithelia and easily pen penetrable. Bacteria within the small intestine are primarily repelled from the epithelia by antibacterial modulators. The distal colon contains two mucus layers, which is a stratified adherent inner mucus layer and loosely adhesive outer mucus layer. The inner mucus layer of the colon is essentially sterile, and the outer mucus layer harbors the intestinal microbiota. Neurons of the submucosal plexus innervate goblet cells by release of neurotransmitters, such as acetylcholine, and vasoactive internal peptide. So these maturation of these goblet cells is influenced by SAM-pointed dominant containing ETS transcription factor. So essentially, before we get into the true nuts and the bolts of it, our mucosal lining is a critical element. And our mucosa, the outer mucosal lining is what communicates with the bacteria. That bacteria is what gives a sensory information signal to vagus nerve and, uh, and the rest of the enteric nervous system. So here you're looking at a schematic diagram on how nutrients affect the human traits through the gut microbiota. So there's your modified gut microbiota. It can lead you down a path of obviously not a good quality microbiota, metabolic diseases, IBD, immune diseases. On the other idea, it can give you physiological diseases, lead you to autism and intelligence. So the modification of the gut microbiota is critical. We need to eat a good diet and we also to need to decrease our toxins that adversely affect our gut health. 
So here we're looking at a gut-brain axis supporting the interactions between the gut microbiota and the central nervous system through direct and indirect pathways involving my favorite, the vagus nerve, cytokine production, and release of neuropeptide and short-chain fatty acids. So the vagus nerve communicates between the gut and the brain in a millisecond. It is your bidirectional nerve communicator. Short-chain fatty acids have just come to the forefront of the conversation uh, in that short-chain fatty acids are metabolites that actually signal to the brain. So probiotics are a critical element to give good bacteria in the gut. Prebiotics are something like food, like artichoke, garlic, onion, leeks. They feed the probiotics. At the end of the day, the probiotic leaves something, which is a 2021 theme, postbiotic. This postbiotic is short-chain fatty acids. Short-chain fatty acids are fuel for the epithelial layer. The health of the epithelial layer is critical to overall signaling in the gut, and obviously the gut signals the brain. So you're seeing this particular pathway. Effects of traumatic brain injury and eubiotic therapies within the microbiota gut to brain axis. Brain injury induces disruptions with the MGBA through multiple pathways. Resulting protuberations complete a bidirectional positive feedback mechanism that contributes to the secondary injury characteristics of TBI. Resolution of gut dysbiosis by therapies may act to break this cycle, thus reducing the impact of secondary injury pathology, improving TBI biochemical, pathological, and behavioral outcomes. Bottom line is when you get a concussion, it's damage to the brain, but most people don't understand that underlying damage to the gut. If you do not take care of that gut issue, you're gonna get a secondary attack from the gut to the brain because they are communicating. So with most of my neurodegenerative patients in their brain, I also adhere to gut protocols. Here's an interaction of the gut microbiota, probiotics, and prebiotics on the brain. Gut-to-brain axis, the effect of the microbiota on the enteric nervous system, leads to the effect of the microbiota on the autonomic and the humoral system, the effect of the microbiota on the central nervous system, all is a component within the confines of the gut-to-brain or brain-to-gut axis. The microbiota gut-brain axis, got a lot going on over here. Direct and indirect pathways support the bidirectional interactions between the gut microbiota and the central nervous system involving endocrine, immune, and neural pathways. On the afferent arm, which is actually the blue arrows, lymphocytes may sense the gut lumen and internally release cytokines which have endocrine or paracrine actions. Sensory neuronal terminals such as on the vagus nerve may be activated by gut peptides released by enteroendocrine sites. Neurotransmitters or its precursors produced as my microbiota metabolites may reach the gut epithelial having endocrine or paracrine. Four, centrally after brain relays, a discrete neural network has been described involving the amygdala and as a main integrator of visceral input. Five, cortical steroids release as the result of the HPA activation, modulating gut microbiota, and six, neuronal efferent activation may inc include the so-called anti-inflammatory cholergenic reflex. So B, essentially you're seeing health conditions that are affected by the MGB, microbiota gut to brain axis, many of which are clearly not just pain and obesity, many of which are systemic issues and of course, brain issues. Molecular pathways involved in the gut to brain axis. They are suggesting signaling pathways and crosstalk between the intestinal microbiota, the intestinal barrier, immune modulators, and neuronal brain vagus and enteric nervous system. The intestinal microbiota can affect the levels of circulating local cytokines, causing leaky gut with increased GI permeability, ultimately affecting or adversely affecting brain function age-related changes in the gut. So essentially what you're seeing is you're gonna see age-related changes in the gut may lead to age-related changes in the brain. The age-related changes is gut dysbiosis. We essentially lose our good population as we age as part of a degeneration process. The two-way crosstalk between the microbiota gut to brain axis. In a healthy population, the glucose metabolism is strictly controlled by 
both neuropeptides originated from the brain and endocrine factors secreted from the digestive system. So essentially, I just want to get to the key element here, what I like. Short-chain fatty acids, which originate from the microbiota in neuropeptides, generated from the epithelial cells will further circulate to the brain and positively affect brain function. So we could speak about this all day long, but again, that gut to brain axis also involves glucose metabolism, kind of, you know, segueing back to my Dr. Rob's gut matrix. So now we're talking about how it modulates what we call DCI. In a diabetic population, metabolic disorders and hypercortisolism will exacerbate hyperglycemia, promote the generalization of advanced glycated end products in inflammatory cytokines in the internal environment. On the other hand, dysbacteriosis or dysbiosis in the gut will dramatically increase the production of endotoxin and decrease the levels of short-chain fatty acids. Both dysbiosis and internal environmental disorder will lead to the intestinal barrier and blood-brain barrier dysfunction, simultaneously facilitating harmful substances that are passing both in a bi-directional manner. How an unhealthy lifestyle can lead to inflammation in the brain. Well, you have an unhealthy lifestyle, you get damage to your gut lining, low-grade inflammation. You're now going to have the release of cytolethal distending toxins, inflammatory cytokines, LPS, which break down the barriers. You now have bacterial toxins, chemicals, foods, pathogens, antibodies, and cytokines breaking the blood-brain barrier, leading to inflammation in the brain, neuroautoimmunity, neurodegeneration, and possibly neuro psychological disorders. This, without question, explains that a lot of the amyloid placking comes from the gut. LPS is abundant in Alzheimer's affected brain neurocortex and hippocampus. LPS activates toll-like receptor 2 and 4. This leads to cytokine production, inflammation, and innate immune defense responses that produce CNS pathology. The microbiome-derived neurotoxins play a strong role in shaping the human system and contributing to neurodegeneration. This is really just piggybacking on what I just said earlier. So toll-like receptors are a critical element. The bottom line is the toll-like receptor is the communication or the signal to the vagus nerve. When you look at the left side, toll-like receptors are not being signaled. The dendrite cells, which I call the periscope for inflammation, are not causing issues. Your macrophages are not on fire. Your vagus nerve is communicating a harmonious signal to your brain. Whereas on the right side, you're seeing a totally different status. Vagus nerve is not communicating. Macrophages are aberrant. Dendrite cells are releasing cytokines. So the microbiome-derived LPS impairment may contribute to the atrophy of neurons and cytoskeleton disorganization of the brain, leading to Alzheimer's disease. This is another example of damage to the gut, amyloids are passing the GI barrier, leading to systemic inflammation with LPS. Blood-brain barrier is now compromised. The blood-brain barrier is now compromised, leading you down a higher incidence of Alzheimer's. So when something passes your gut, it goes into your bloodstream, you have an immune system to possibly ameliorate it. However, when it passes your blood-brain barrier, the only thing it has to feast on is brain tissue. This figure depicts the possible pathogenic events associated with gut dysbiosis and leading to the peripheral and central pathological events, which would increase the risk of AD. The gut to brain axis, boy, I haven't talked about that yet. Communication barriers and physiological barriers. Peripheral and brain homostatic control is performed by the intestines, epithelia and blood brain barriers under healthy conditions. The rupture of one barrier, as an example, the gut may impact the other barriers, as I said before, the brain, with the bloodstream and immune system being the facilitators or the arbitrators of the pathological spread in neuroinflammation. Immune system-mediated regulation of blood or regulation of brain function, excuse me. Proper immune system response plays a critical role in protecting and maximizing brain function. Lack of T-cell regulation leads to inappropriate activation of meningeal macrophages and microglial cells causing impairment of brain function. The gut-brain inflammation, without question, we are covering this in full, uh, 
in, in full magnitude, if you will. So when we take a look, here we go. So number one, stress such as medications, transmitters, enzymes, a neuropeptide, intestinal flora dysregulation leads to inflammatory fragments or something from a dietary protein. Number two, these fragments can diffuse into endothelial cells lining the GI tract. Number three, interleukin-1, which is one of the products of fragment of dietary proteins bind to interleukin-1 receptor on the lateral border of the adjacent epithelial cell. Number four, NF-kappa B is activated. Five, activated NF-kappa B further binds to DNA sequence in nucleus of endothelial cells stimulating mRNA. Now this mRNA in number six travels to the cytosol and is translated into specific proteins. Those proteins are MLCK. That's myosin light chain kinase. Those proteins in number seven bind to and open up the tight junctions where dietary fragment proteins are released into the paracellular space. Eight, these particles are further released into the reticular tissue. Nine, APC recognizes the dietary fragment and presents to the T cells. Head. T cells generate killer T cells attacking epithelial cells that contain these inflammatory dietary fragments. 11, your B cells are activated by T cells presenting the dietary fragment. In response, B cells generate antibodies against tight junction proteins, IgG and IgM antibodies against diet peptides. This leads to a cross reaction in various tissues and induction of autoimmune disorders in different organs. So essentially, you are seeing as a step-by-step -step process how the gut can ultimately release inflammation and get to the brain via its bidirectional pathway. So there's a new gut-brain link, and it's very interesting to me. The gut imbalance link with neurological disorders, the common thread is the gut mucus, the new brain connection, treating the brain because the gut is the second brain. So your GI mucus, there's more nutrients from food that can be easily absorbed in the SI. The colon mucus is thick and should be impenetrable to bacteria. Your mucus, full of peptides to kill bacteria, small intestine, energy source, feeding some bacteria. The conclusion, bottom line, reduced gut mucus protection may make patients with neurological diseases more susceptible to GI problems. Ultimately leading to the problem or as they say, here is your brain being out of order. Head injuries may lead to Alzheimer's. So essentially, if you have a concussion, you have a higher incidence of Alzheimer's. Onset could be accelerated by nine years. This is a long, interesting slide. Essentially, this gives you, and this is for your edification, this gives you the timeline of inflammation following a TBI. This is worth looking at going through, but it's really evocative in that it really explains the different timing, triggers, and key regulatory points it's from a traumatic brain injury concussion. So one of the big things here I want everybody to note is the secondary injury process of traumatic brain injury includes blood-brain barrier disruption, neuroinflammation, excitotoxicity, metabolic impairments, apoptosis, oxidative stress, ischemia, and many others. The association with the blood-brain impairment, microglial and astrocyte activation, leukocyte infiltration, upregulation of pro-inflammatory cytokines are typically characteristic of a neuroinflammatory response to a TBI. This is a very beautifully laid out graphic slide. It depicts TBI and TBI depending factors impacting the blood brain barrier and the onset of secondary brain injuries. Its representation of the blood brain barrier as a source and target of neuroinflammation in TBI is robust. Note that the inflammation and reactive oxygen species generate associated with TBI can further impact the blood brain barrier in addition to mechanical trauma. The loss of the blood-brain barrier integrity further promotes neuronal damage and the onset of central nervous system disorders. The blood-brain barrier, it's a filtration. It lets good things in and keeps out viruses and bacteria, hopefully. Evidence indicates damage to the blood-brain barrier allows amyloids into the brain, amyloid, amyloid plaquing, and it's comprised of cell linings that actually deal with 400 miles of arteries and veins. 
the blood-brain barrier. Let's delve into that a little bit. Blood capillaries are surrounded by astrocytic processes, which enhance transcapillary molecular transport. Small molecules such as gases or lipid-soluble substances in the capillary lumen can travel into tissue fluid via diffusion. Larger molecules such as glucose, amino acids, or hydrophilic proteins are released from the brain capillary into tissue via protein carriers. So here we are, we're looking at a blown up, if you will, blood-brain barrier. Now understand, as I said earlier, the blood-brain barrier is also made up of occludin, zonulin, and actin. Also, autoantibodies made against gut barrier can also attack blood-brain barrier proteins. Antibodies made against the gut barrier proteins can also attack these. So here you have an activated astrocyte. Here you have a compromised tight junction versus an intact tight junction. Blood-brain barrier antigens released from astrocytes. You've also got endothelial cells. You've got the whole idea about the antibodies being produced. So when you look at the left side, you're truly looking at the intact, intact tight junctions. In there, you have few autoreactive antibodies. Whereas on the right side, you have many autoreactive antibodies. But as long as you have an intact tight junction, look at the left and right, respectively, bottoms. The few autoreactive antibodies don't come out. So they never touch and damage the astrocytes or astrocyte end footing for structure. They don't damage neurons, no damage. As long as the junctions, tight junctions are intact, even though you have many autoreactive antibodies, the astrocytes are not damaged and the neurons are still functioning appropriately. Now we look at disrupted tight junctions where few autoreactive antibodies. You have slightly damaged astrocytes. You have minor damage. Neurons may recover through proper treatment, lifestyle, et cetera. Whereas on the right side, these many autoreactive antibodies damage a lot of astrocytes. Your structure of the blood-brain barrier is breaking. The neuron is uh, receiving extensive damage, ultimately leading to neuronal cell death. You may not be able to recover. So the whole component or one of the bigger ideas is try and keep your autoimmunity down. Try and keep your tight junctions, both in your gut and your brain, intact. So physiological changes associated with TBI that may facilitate a biomarker discovery for this type of injury. Again, a beautifully graphically uh, presented slide. Disruption of the blood-brain barrier, BBB, in response to TBI may increase concentrations of brain-specific molecules in circulation. An evaluation of serum concentrations of these molecules may benefit TBI diagnosis. So several neural-specific proteins, including NSE, UCHL, and PRP may be released from damaged neurons and could enter the blood if the blood-brain barrier integrity is compromised. Additionally, NFS can be released as the result of traumatic axonal injury. The presence of these oligodendrocyte-specific proteins, such as MPB, in serum may indicate that you had a TBI. And the presence of serum albumin which is found in high levels in blood in the CSF also indicates a breach of the blood-brain barrier. Neuroinflammatory molecules such as interleukin and matrix metalloproteinase 9 in the CSF may also have the potential to evaluate the extent of MTBI or TBIs. Neuroimaging may be useful, not quite as useful as we think. The bottom line is after that brief dissertation, there are proteins and there are blood tests that enable you to determine the extent of the damage from a TBI and whether that TBI can lead you down an enhanced path towards neurodegenerative diseases, i.e. Alzheimer's. Concussion, biomarkers for recovery time. The study had 195 military veterans, average age 38, 85% were male, 45 had no, of them had no history of concussions, 94 had one to two concussions, 56 had three or more concussions, Last concussion was seven years ago for any one of the people in the study. They measured the levels of the protein in the blood, and they measured the levels of the exosomes in the blood. The result, very simply, NFL, neurofilament light, was 33% higher in those with three or more concussions. Exosomal levels was 34% in the above group. Let's look as we compare that to Alzheimer's. 
The findings support the promise of plasma neurofilament light as a biomarker of active neurodegeneration and detection and tracking of Alzheimer's disease and evaluation of disease modifying therapies. So sleep loss impairs the blood brain barrier. So after periods of sleep loss, the blood brain barrier is negatively affected in many ways. Inflammatory signaling causing TNF, alpha and interleukin six increases leading to the breakdown of tight junction proteins. That's depicted in the purple. This causes gaps between endothelial cells, allowing unwanted immune cells and antibodies to enter the brain. After sleep loss, the endothelial cells also make fewer of the transport of proteins, which is depicted in the blue and the yellow, that are required to shuttle necessary molecules between the brain and the blood. The blood-brain damage, if you will, blood-brain barrier damage occurs with mild TBI. Evidence of damage to the blood-brain barrier without a reported concussion was seen in adolescent and adult athletes. That was, MRI was used. Interesting, obesity, insulin resistance has an adverse effect on the blood-brain barrier. Obesity and insulin resistance can break down the blood-brain barrier, resulting in problems with learning and memory, all related to structural changes in the hippocampus. Diabetes also promoted shrinkage of the tight junctions. The periocytes became dysfunctional and inflamed. Swelling of the astral site and feet were also indicated. Let's take a good look at how our blood-brain barrier can get breached. Number one, exposure to environmental factors, food proteins, chemicals, pathogens, unhealthy lifestyle. Leads to a disturbance in the microbiome, gut barrier breach, immune reactivity, and systemic inflammation. From the other side, traumatic brain injury and physical and emotional stress can damage it. Also, exposure to oral nasal antigens. Migration to the brain through oral and nasal pathways. All can damage the blood-brain barrier breach. Entry of cross-reactive antibodies and inflammatory molecules into the brain. Leading you down a path of depletion of growth factors, microglial activation, neurotoxicity, neurodegeneration, and amyloid beta and tau aggregation. Alzheimer's blood test. Blood test, and again, we're looking for neurofilament light. Some people say NFL, some people go NF L. This normally resides inside the brain cells. When damaged, dying cells leak into the central uh, cerebral spinal fluid. Protein then travels into the bloodstream. NFL predicts symptoms 16 years ahead of Alzheimer's. So it's a great test to take, it's one that I strongly recommend. What lifestyle changes would you consider? What lifestyle changes would you use if you were trying to avoid neurodegenerative disease and Alzheimer's? Well, we spoke a lot about them at the beginning. Number one would be exercise. Number two, increase your sleep. Number three, reduce stress. Number four, brain training. Five, resolve inflammation. Six, inhibit new inflammation. Seven, Remove all inflammatory sources. So we're getting a common theme that we need to manage and modulate our inflammation. We need to decrease the inflammation and we clearly need to not let it run over a long period of time. And for me, heal the gut. Heal the gut in my 7R program. In essence, my 7R program is very simply reset your lifestyle because all that you're going to do to your gut, you're going to do to your brain. So you want to reset your lifestyle. Good diet, no gluten, no processed food, no sugar, no dairy, no nicotine, no artificial sweeteners, exercise, positive thoughts, meditation, etc. Number two, you want to remove. Do what? You want to remove your pathogens. You want to do so through detoxification. You want to do so through oregano oils. You want to do so by removing pathogens. Then R number three is you want to replace. You want to replace with digestive enzymes and pancreatic enzymes. Four, you want to regenerate. You want to rejuvenate. You want to heal and seal the gut lining. Five, you want to re-inoculate. You want to re-inoculate with good positive bacteria. Six, you want to retest or reintroduce. Retest to see where you are if you reached maximum nutritional outcome. And you want to um, reintroduce certain foods that you may no longer be allergic to. And last but not least, you want to retain. You went through this whole process to get yourself healthy. Let's retain your health. Let's not run for that pizza immediately. Sleep and Alzheimer's. 
The study found when young, healthy men were deprived of just one night of sleep, they had higher levels of tau proteins in their blood. Sleep, critical element to allow your immune system to recharge, to rejuvenate. It allows your brain to detox. Your brain shrinks to 40% of its normal size. When it's shrinking, I'm squeezing my hands now. It's squeezing out all these toxic wastes. It's detoxing it, your brain and it's doing so and it's pushing out all these tau proteins. Relationship between the lymphatic system and brain states. The lymphatic system is exactly what we talked about yesterday. It's that metabolic way, yesterday before, excuse me, the metabolic waste clearance. So essentially you're able to have the lymphatic flow to detox your brain, to clear out your metabolic wastes at a much more efficient rate when you're sleeping as opposed to when you're awake. Air pollution in green spaces, multiple pathways to the brain. Once inhales, pollutant particles can enter the brain directly via the nasal olfactory pathway or indirectly through the circulatory system after they penetrate the lung tissue. They cause inflammation in the nose and lungs and release pro-inflammatory cytokines into circulation. Additionally, they activate the HPA axis. This axis and increase the blood levels of stress hormones, including cortisol. Both pro-inflammatory cytokines and cortisol can reach the brain. Green space produces health-promoting chemicals and negative air ions, which affect the brain through similar pathways, but in the opposite direction. Most people wouldn't realize pollution. What we're seeing is the air polluted or if we live closer to a highway is more deleterious to our overall health status. Concussion. Concussions are linked to brain changes in people at a genetic risk for Alzheimer's. APOE4 plays a critical role in the maintenance, repair, and growth of neurons and seems to have an important part of the natural response to the brain injury. The E4 isomer results in reduced growth and branching of neurons in vitro and seems to have an important part in the neuronal response to injury. It's not just E4. You get one from your mommy and you get one from your daddy, if you will. So it's truly E4 over E4. And we just spoke about that a little bit more. Interesting in that the E4 isomer results in reduced growth and branching of neurites in vitro and seems to have that important part to play in the neuronal response to injury. I am strongly recommending that everybody always tests their APOE4 status. APO4, it's a gene on chromosome 19. It encodes the instructions for making protein that helps transport cholesterol and other types of fat in the bloodstream. There's three main EPOEs. APOE2 is very rare. If you inherit this allele, it's without question extremely protective of developing Alzheimer's. As I made earlier, um, a point that doesn't mean you won't get it. It just means that you don't have a propendency towards it. And remember, these are a gene. Genes are not your destiny. They load the gun. Your environment and your lifestyle fires the gun. So you've got a perfect APOE2. Don't mess it up with bad lifestyle. APOE3, E3 over E3, that's actually me, most common allele, no real effect. Again, do the right thing, minimize your incidence. APOE4, beeping red light, 25 to 30% of the population. It's the most common Alzheimer's allele. It's almost a third of the people have that. So if you have it, you really want to spend careful attention to avoiding your incidence of Alzheimer's because of your genes. Remember, genes are not your destiny. They're only 10 to 30% of what you can express. The APOE4 supports the concept that there's reduced response to anti-dyslipidemia treatments in E4 carriers, reinforces usefulness of APOE4 genotypes in predicting patient response to lipid-lowering therapies. This blew me away when I saw it. I wanted to add this as soon as I can. The Alzheimer's gene was linked to higher risk of severe COVID-19. Having two copies of the E4 variant of APOE4 gene linked to double the risk of severe COVID-19. Studies the latest to suggest genetics play a role in why some people are more vulnerable to coronavirus than others. Genes are without question a player. APOE4 gives rise to proteins involved in carrying facts around 
the body. That's not facts. That should be fats. So I'll say that again, um, and I'll make the correction when we send it in. APOE4 gives rise to the proteins involving and carrying fats around the body. They're known to affect cholesterol levels and process in inflammation. The research has found through 383,000 European ancestries, 9,022 positive for two copies of the E4 variant increased the risk of dementia by 14 times. Positive COVID-19 test, March 16th to April 26, 2020, 37 people tested positive for the two E4 alleles. That was two times the risk for COVID-19. The conclusion, possible that the role of APO4 in the immune system is important in the disease, not just Alzheimer's, but COVID-19. Alzheimer's disease, we spoke a little bit about it at the beginning. Actually, we're going to expand upon it a little bit more now. The sixth leading cause of death in the U.S., seventh in the world, from 2000 to 2015, heart attack deaths increased by 11%, Alzheimer's deaths increased by 123%. One in three seniors die from Alzheimer's and dementia, kills more than breast and prostate cancer combined. Alzheimer's dementia, as we talked about earlier, cost in 2018 $277 billion projected 1.1 trillion in 2050. Someone in the U.S. develops the disease every 65 seconds. Women's brains and Alzheimer's, for some reason, women are more susceptible. 60 to 70% of Alzheimer's sufferers are women. So women with mild cognitive impairment are found to decline faster than men with similar diagnosis. Similar levels of biomarkers may have different prognostic values for men and women, the potential female risk factors are loss of ovary, number of pregnancies, and possibly hypertensive complications during pregnancy. There's mounting evidence indicating microglial cells are different in women than men, and to piggyback on that, that is true. They do function differently. Gingivitis leads to an increased incidence of Alzheimer's. The bacteria creates destructive enzymes, infiltrates the brain, and causes inflamed damage. Over 90% of Alzheimer's diseases samples had this genopans. It also was identified in the cerebral spinal fluid. A possible missing link in Alzheimer's. Buildup of beta amyloid activates receptor. Receptor responds to norepinephrine. Activation of beta amyloid norepinephrine boosts the activity of an enzyme that activates tau. Essentially, beta amyloid hijacks norepinephrine pathway to trigger toxic buildup of tau. Disturbances of the brain gut microbiota axis in Alzheimer's. So as you see, it's bi-directional. Let's start from the top. The brain, central nervous system, leaky blood-brain barrier, neuroinflammation, having central amyloid formation, neurodegeneration leading to gut damage because the gut is the communicator of the enteric nervous system. The enteric nervous system communicates with the central nervous system. The gut now can have leaky gut, gut inflammation, amyloid formation, and enteric neurons, and the microbiota. Microbiota can lead to dysbiosis, LPS production, bacteria, amyloid formation, and you can reverse it right from the microbiota to the gut, to the brain. I'm a big proponent of considering a quality detox for cognitive decline, getting the toxic wastes out of these people's brains and clearing out their blood-brain barrier toxicity. So to speak to that a little bit more, pathogens lead to toxin and antigens. You're getting an immune response. This slide then shows antibody production against pathogens and toxins, leading to antibodies binding to amyloid beta through cross-reactivity, leading to amyloid plaque formation. Now, you also can have the pathogen causing amyloid plaque formation, making the antibodies, et cetera, et cetera. But the bottom line is, I really want to speak to the idea of these pathogens, or if the body sees pathogens, this cross-reactivity, this autoimmunity, this inability to modulate and manage our inflammation is leading us down a path of many of our injuries, but truly neural degeneration. So once again, talking about the blood-brain barrier, here we have environmental triggers. And in those environmental triggers, we have damage to the blood vessels. We're making antibodies. We have amyloid beta. A break in the blood-brain barrier leads us down a path of damaging an axon and astrocytic end footings. You're getting receptor stripping, dendritic degeneration, a collapse, ultimately cell death, and amyloid plaque formation. 
So when you look at your gut, I mean, what have you done for your guts lately? Do you have the guts to be healthy? Here you're truly depicting on the top, the LPS and leaky gut. You're looking at the tear. There's a tear right there in what we call the tight junction. You're looking at a tear through the epithelial cell. That is, that's the actomyosin damage. So it's great to consider the tests, but you really want to know what's going inside the gut because if you're able to prevent the damage to the gut, you may be able to slow or stop the damage or this sequela to your brain in that. Mucosal immune abnormalities lead you down a path of imbalanced gut flora, leading to intestinal barrier dysfunction, systemic inflammation, neuroinflammation, neuroinvasion, ultimately looking at neural degeneration. Once again, if it passes your gut, it doesn't mean that it has to damage a lot. It, your gut barrier. If it passes the pathogen, the antigen, if it passes your blood-brain barrier, it's inside your brain and it's got brain tissue to feast on. So let's take a look at it another way. Toxic chemicals can lead to loss of immune tolerance, can lead you down a path of imbalanced microbiota and gut inflammation, leads to a loss of gut integrity, entry of LPS, undigested dietary components and circulation, humoral and cell-mediated immune response, leading to cross-reaction with various tissue antigens, leading to loss of blood-brain barrier integrity, ultimately leading to multi-organ tissue inflammation and autoimmunity. If you saw my first webinar, you all know that I have a book coming out. My book should be out in October of 2020. Please keep an eye out for my book called Superhighway to Health, Seven Steps to Optimizing the Gut-Brain Connection. Many of the themes that we talked about will be in the book on uh, that release date. Always like to end with a quote. Take care of your body. It's the only place you have to live. Jim Rome is a fav of mine. Remember, it's a horrible thing to watch somebody degenerate or yourself degenerate in front of your eyes. Please start thinking about gut health. Think, please start thinking about lifestyle changes. Please start having people test. Think about the proper nutrient supplements, the proper diet, the proper foods, the things that are necessary. You know, we only have, we said it best. It's the only place we have to live is our body and maybe our most important organ is our brain. And it's so overlooked, three pounds, 25% of our calories go to our brain. Um, it's 25% of our caloric intake, as I said before, and let's not forget as much as I said it, the gut communicates with the brain, the brain communicates with the gut and the body's all interconnected. So some, anyone has any questions, there's my, um, website. You can contact me, do a lot of Facebooks. We'll be doing an upcoming Facebook with Da Vinci, multiple Facebooks. So DR Robert Silverman, and there's a Facebook group. I can tell you that it's been my pleasure. I look forward to hearing from you. Best of luck, and just remember, health is without question wealth.